What's up guys? Welcome to another episode in my rewrite series for the DC Extended Universe. In this video, I'm going to be pitching to you guys a movie that currently does not exist on DC's slate of live action films, but it is a story that I nevertheless think would be a very interesting story to tell in a live action series surrounding Superman. For those of you who may be new to my channel, I want to give you guys a quick disclaimer and let you all know that this video that you're watching right now is part of a larger project where I am rewriting the DCEU as if it were streamlined by a singular and more cohesive vision. So naturally, the video that preluded this one was my rewrite on Batman v Superman Dawn of Justice. So if you guys want, you can go ahead and check out those rewrite videos just so you're not completely lost while listening to this pitch. I'll post the links to the Batman v Superman rewrite in the description below. So without further ado, let's dive right into my pitch for a live action adaptation of Reign of the Superman for the DCEU. Okay, right off the bat, for those of you who don't know, Reign of the Superman is a comic book arc that ran from June to October of 1993. It was the final chapter in the Death of Superman trilogy and the basic premise of that arc was that after Superman's death at the hands of Doomsday, four new Supermen mysteriously appear on the scene, each of them significantly different from each other, but nonetheless, they each claim to be the resurrected Man of Steel. These four Supermen include John Henry Irons, aka Steel, Connor Kent, also known as Superboy, The Eradicator, and Cyborg Superman. All four of them believe to have the most legitimate claim to Superman's legacy, and this inheritance dispute leads to a dramatic competition between the Supermen as alliances are forged and broken in an attempt to determine who is the true successor to the Man of Steel. Now even though this reign of the Superman arc usually follows up as a sequel to some kind of iteration of the death of Superman, I think this film could actually take place at any time in the DCEU timeline post the Zack Snyder's Justice League. So long as you make sure that Superman is out of the picture at the beginning of the movie, he doesn't have to be dead or anything, but you could take this basic premise and execute it to tell whatever kind of story you want with the four Supermen. Basically, what I'm trying to say is that there are ways to make this story flexible with the DCEU. As the saying goes, there's more than one way to skin a cat. But I do think that the best time to use this particular story within my version of the DCEU would be right after my rewrite for Batman v Superman. Since at the end of that story, Superman is fatally wounded by kryptonite and hidden away from the rest of the world in the Fortress of Solitude so that he can heal in peace. But the rest of the world presumes that the Man of Steel is dead. Bruce, Alfred, Lois, and Martha are the only ones that know Clark is still alive but they're choosing to keep it a secret so that Kal-El can remain safe while he's in recovery. So, in the wake of Superman's quote-unquote death, the rest of the world will take advantage of his absence and seize some capital. Entrepreneurs like Lex Luthor will try to create their own Superman that is completely corporate-owned, while religious groups like the Covenant of Krypton will worship Superman and try to resurrect him. And then you have genuine, good-hearted, everyday citizens like Steel who want to follow Superman's example as an altruist and give back to the world. It's a very interesting story, and if done right, it could be an intriguing exploration of the themes of faith, hope, individuality, identity, legacy, and even patriotism and freedom. This reign of the Superman adaptation could very well be the DCEU's equivalent of the Falcon and the Winter Soldier TV show, as a case study on one of the greatest icons in American history. Superman himself. Not to mention, having a story that completely deconstructs Superman through the lens of his legacy and how people respond to his death totally falls in line with the realistic portrayal of Superman that Zack Snyder wanted to tell for the DCEU. 2013's Man of Steel was about giving Clark Kent a more realistic origin story, and Batman vs Superman was about deconstructing Superman's place in society. Now, this movie can deconstruct Superman's legacy. Like a famous visionary director once said, Again, it's like poetry, it's sort of if they rhyme. Mm -hmm. Every stanza kind of rhymes with the last one. Hopefully it'll work. As a side note, I'm not exactly married to the idea of using Reign of the Superman as the title for this film, 
and I'm open to alternative titles like Men of Tomorrow or The New Sons of Krypton. But for reference's sake, in this video, we'll just continue to call this film by the working title Reign of the Superman. The main protagonist of this film will be the most idealistic and altruistic of the four Supermen, John Henry Irons, also known as Steel. While the role of the deuteragonist, the second most important protagonist in the story, will go to Superboy, since he will have his own subplot that connects with the main plot concerning Steel. Lois Lane, on the other hand, will become the tritagonist. Naturally, Lois will be the Daily Planet reporter working on the new Superman case as she wants to make sure nobody is sullying Superman's good name. Her investigation will lead to her encountering all four Supermen. She'll be the glue that brings all the Superman successors together because most, if not all, of the Supermen will respect the infamous Lois Lane and listen to her due to her strong connection with the original Man of Steel. Just like in Batman v Superman, Lex Luthor will return as our main antagonist. The Covenant of Krypton, which is based off the Cult of Connor from the DC Comics, will serve as minor antagonists in this film alongside the Eradicator. For this rewrite, I'm actually going to replace Cyborg Superman with Bizarro as the fourth Superman successor. Even though Bizarro is mostly portrayed as an antagonist, I think he would be a much more compelling character if he became an anti-villain or an anti-hero as opposed to just being another physical obstacle that the heroes have to overcome. Which is another reason why I didn't include Bizarro in my rewrite for Batman v Superman, despite everyone wanting Bizarro to replace Doomsday, because Bizarro has so much more potential as a morally ambiguous character than he does as just a run-of-the-mill supervillain. Bizarro could be the wild card in this ensemble of Superman successors. Not counting the actual Frankenstein in DC Comics, Bizarro is essentially the DC's equivalent of Frankenstein's monster in terms of morality and how people treat him. Having him be a tragic anti-villain, I think would be the best route to take his character in the DCEU. As for the Eradicator, he's actually going to take Cyborg Superman's role as the villainous Superman successor, and Cyborg Superman will be reduced to a minor cameo just because it would convolute the story if we had to stop and explain the detailed origins of Hank Henshaw when we can easily just give his role in the story to Eradicator and save ourselves the trouble of trying to cram in unnecessary extra lore into this movie. Now, let's move on to the opening scene of this film. The prologue will start with Lex Luthor, the new mayor of Metropolis, visiting one of LexCorp's laboratories, where we see a cloning facility filled with rows of incubation tanks containing malformed abominations that vaguely resemble human bodies. Lex Luthor's goal in this film is to create his own Superman that only he can control. He wants the people of Earth to worship an idol of his creation therefore giving him all the power and praise since he is in reality the puppet master pulling the strings. In secret, Lex starts up Project Cadmus, a LexCorp program dedicated to creating the perfect clone of Superman. Lex is able to acquire Superman's DNA for Project Cadmus' experiments from some of Superman's blood that was found on one of the OMAC drones that Superman destroyed back in my Batman v Superman rewrite. Using that limited sample of DNA, the scientists of Project Cadmus begin working on creating the perfect clone of Kal-El. Unfortunately, the project runs to complications since the blood sample collected was mixed with other chemicals like the metal from the drone's body along with some dirt and dust that came from the debris of the battle. Therefore, the clone's cells continue to decompose and it becomes increasingly difficult for Project Cadmus to produce a living, breathing, sentient creature, let alone a perfect clone of Superman. But in his hubris, Lex refuses to quit. He will find a way to undermine God, and what better way to do that than to make God your servant. Dr. Westfield, the director of Project Cadmus, creates the first attempt at a Superman clone, but they immediately recognize that something is wrong. This clone looks severely different from Superman and is nowhere near as intelligent. This is Bizarro. I'm not too sure how Bizarro would get his name in this version, but if you guys have any ideas, then go ahead and leave a suggestion down below. I know Nando V Movies came up with a good origin for Bizarro's name in his Batman v Superman rewrite, so maybe that could be an option here as well. But anyways, 
Lex and Dr. Westfield quickly realize that Bizarro's cellular composition is unstable. Not only is Bizarro a mutated and imperfect clone, but he's also dying. Without a pure sample of Kryptonian DNA, the clones will continue to decompose at a cellular level. Lex orders Dr. Westfield to euthanize Bizarro as a defective clone and to keep on trying. But Bizarro has other plans. Bizarro refuses to go out quietly, and he manages to break out of the facility and flee into the wild. Afterwards, Dr. Westfield will attempt to solve the cellular deterioration issue that they had with Bizarro by substituting the new clone's vital organs with cybernetics. And this is where we get our cameo of Cyborg Superman. Even though Dr. Westfield's cybernetics did stabilize the newest breed of clone, Luthor is displeased with the final result. Luthor doesn't want his Superman to be a machine that can be destroyed like his OMAC drones. He wants something better, something stronger. He wants a real, perfect Kryptonian of flesh and bone. Plus, Luthor thinks that Cyborg Superman is too ugly, and so the clone is euthanized, and Dr. Westfield and his team go back to the drawing board. Eventually, Dr. Westfield and his crew create the best clone that they've managed to produce so far, Superboy. They introduce the new teenage specimen to Luthor as the boy's body floats in the cloning tank, crouched in a fetal position. Luthor smirks as we cut to the film's title sequence. We then open on Dr. John Henry Irons, an engineer at LexCorp, studying one of the Kryptonian suits of armor that were retrieved from the Black Zero event. The screen reads, three days before the OMAC incident. As Dr. Irons leaves, he bumps into Dr. Blake, the director of the Brother Eye Project, and the two scientists have a friendly chat about their individual assignments, exchange a few jokes, and Dr. Blake invites Irons over for dinner with his family. Irons. Being a bachelor who lives alone in his apartment, accepts the invitation and ends up having a lovely evening with Dr. Blake and his wife and kids. Four days later, Dr. Irons sees Lex Luthor appear on the news, blaming the deceased Dr. Blake for the OMAC incident and labeling him as a terrorist and a saboteur. Suspecting foul play from Luthor, but having no evidence to prove it, Dr. Irons submits his resignation for LexCorp after attending Dr. Blake's funeral and seeing his family grieve over the loss of an innocent life. But as an act of retaliation, the HR representatives at LexCorp falsified Dr. Irons' reasons for leaving the company, saying that he was fired for misconduct rather than quitting. Because of this, Dr. Irons' career as a scientist is ruined and he is forced to make a career shift into construction instead. Without his LexCorp salary, Dr. Irons is evicted from his luxury apartment and moves back into his childhood home with his grandparents, his sister, and her kids. Irons will be one of the millions of Metropolis citizens who attend Superman's public funeral when the Brother Eye satellite footage is leaked, and the world assumes the Man of Steel to be dead. At Superman's services, Dr. Irons will have a flashback of when he met the Man of Steel. It had been during a high-speed chase in downtown Metropolis. A couple of thieves were road raging to escape Superman after he foiled their heist, and Dr. Irons, who was in the middle of crossing the street, was about to get caught in the crossfire. But Superman flew down and rescued Irons, and in return, Irons managed to restrain one of the criminals trying to escape. After the crime had been stopped, Dr. Irons tried to literally repay Superman for his help, insisting that Superman accept the cash in his wallet as a token of gratitude. Superman kindly refused, telling Dr. Irons that his parents raised him to believe that doing the right thing should be free. Dr. Irons understands, expressing that his grandparents taught him the very same thing, so he asks Superman what else he could possibly do to express his appreciation. Superman tells him, live a life worth saving before flying off into the sky. The memory of that meeting has left such an impact on Dr. Irons that he will remember it until the day he dies. Fast forward to Dr. Irons working at a construction site in the present day and getting ready to take his lunch when he notices a bunch of neighborhood kids playing in the construction site. The former Dr. Irons will tell the kids the story about the legendary folk hero John Henry, a steel driver who made history by drilling a hole into the side of a mountain faster than a steam engine. As the story ends, Irons gets back to work and the kids turn to leave, but a drive-by suddenly occurs 
as two rival gangs open fire on each other out in broad daylight. But these gangsters are using high-tech machinery, and Irons recognizes their advanced firearms as the same nanotech weaponry that the OMAG drones were originally equipped with. Something isn't right here. Maybe one of these gangs can be led by mob boss Bruno Mannheim, a villain from Superman's rogues gallery. Anyways, one of the neighborhood kids is caught in the crossfire of the street war, and he dies in Dr. Irons' arms. Later that night, Irons watches the local news as they report the tragic drive-by, and the reporter goes on to explain that the incident is one of many that have been occurring across the city. A large crime wave has washed over Metropolis after Superman's death. Every day, the streets of Metropolis are getting more and more dangerous, and without their guardian angel, the city bemoans for someone to deliver them from the strife. Irons mulls over Superman's words, live a life worth living. He suspects LexCorp to be involved with the rise in crime and begins putting his scientific merit to work. Based solely off his photographic memory, Irons forges himself the iconic suit of metallic armor and will base it off of the Kryptonian armor that Zod and his warriors wore in the Man of Steel movie. The suit functions practically the same way that the Kryptonian armor did, giving the wearer enhanced speed, strength, and endurance. But Dr. Irons improves upon it by adding the ability of flight, infrared vision, and a rivet gun to his right arm. In Superman's memory, Irons commits himself to getting the LexCorp nanotech weapons off the streets. He takes some inspiration from his namesake, the mythical John Henry, and builds a smart hammer for himself. But since Irons is a man of science, he's had no prior combat training and is not really a proficient fighter. So he relies more on his technology to fight crime more than anything else. Yes, with the strain of the suit, he can wield the mighty smart hammer, but he doesn't have any technique in wielding such a heavy melee weapon, and he relies more on his rivet gun, his rockets, and the suit's raw strength to win a fight. The helmet is connected to the smart hammer, where it will pinpoint weaknesses and targets for the wearer to strike, forming a symbiosis between helmet and hammer. The helmet will also have a scanner and possess all of the same abilities as Iron Man's online systems. Although, Irons never claims to be the true Superman, people begin to call him the Man of Steel because of his metallic armor. This new vocation brings Irons into contact with Dan Turpin, the head of Metropolis' Special Crimes Unit and an acquaintance of Lois Lane's. Turpin is a conservative cop who doesn't like the idea of having more vigilantes crop up in his city, but he admits that the rise in crime needs a higher caliber of law enforcement than what the Special Crimes Unit can offer. So, he grudgingly agrees to work with Steel. We cut to a group of thugs vandalizing the Superman memorial statue and harassing a nearby jogger. A dashing teenage boy dressed in a sleek and stylish Superman suit intervenes by dropping down from the sky and placing himself between the vandals and the girl. Claiming to be the new Superman, Superboy wipes the floor with the thugs, takes a pair of sunglasses off one of them, puts them on, and then kisses the jogger before taking off into the sky. Mayor Lex Luthor then makes a public statement the next morning as he unveils his plan for fixing the crime wave. Lex introduces Superboy to the world, and he does everything that he can to build Superboy up and emphasize that his loyalties lie with LexCorp. Superboy instantly becomes a Justin Bieber type of celebrity who becomes more concerned with putting on a show and being famous than putting in the actual work to save people. Superboy will visit the Daily Planet to announce Superman's triumphant return, but Lois Lane isn't buying it, and she gives him the nickname Superboy, which seems to really offend him. Regardless, Superboy flirts with Lois, and Perry White jumps in on the opportunity to acquire exclusive interview rights with Superboy. Perry then assigns Lois and Jimmy Olsen to this task, and instructs them to stay close to the kid and to keep up on all of his exploits. But of course, Lois, being the headstrong reporter that she is, will veer off course from her given assignment and instead start investigating the mysterious connection between LexCorp, the crime rate, and this new crop of supermen. While Lois secretly arranges a meeting with Steel and gains his support in uncovering this mystery, Superboy will be called back to the LexCorp lab by Lex Luthor. Lex wants the clone to go through a series of tests to see if Superboy is ready for his next assignment. Superboy is programmed with multiple forms of hand-to-hand -hand combat, and even though he's proven to be excellent at fighting human criminals, Lex wants to give his clone a real test. 
he makes an arrangement with Amanda Waller to have some of her metahuman inmates from Belle Reve visit the LexCorp facility and fight Superboy in a gladiator match. This is where we can have some neat cameos from other Superman villains who may not get a chance to be seen on screen otherwise, like the Parasite, Livewire, and the Silver Banshee. Waller insists that she doesn't want her assets damaged, and Lex carelessly replies that if any of the inmates die, he'll compensate Waller for her troubles. Superboy will prove successful in his fights with all three supervillains, but he's got a huge chip on his shoulder and like most teenagers, becomes arrogant and starts to think that he's untouchable. Superboy will complain to Lex about how his suit got torn and ruined during the brawl. Lex will roll his eyes and tell Superboy that he'll get him a new suit. This is why I hate kids, Lex will mumble under his breath as he stressfully rubs his eyes. Have you tried putting a bomb in their necks? Works wonders for me. That's a tad too excessive for my taste, Amanda. Touche. With those tests completed, Waller and her prisoners leave the facility, and Lex assigns Superboy with his first real mission. Lex core satellites have tracked down their lost lab rat, Bizarro, and Lex wants Superboy to find Bizarro and destroy him. Lex tells Superboy that Bizarro is a threat to the public and must be eliminated before he can harm any civilians. But in reality, Lex just wants to tie up any loose ends and delete any unwanted evidence of Project Cadmus. But after Superboy fails to kill Bizarro and continues to act brashly and impulsively, Lex decides that the boy has too much free will and is unmanageable. He labels Superboy as yet another defective clone within Project Cadmus and attempts to euthanize him like the others. But the assassination fails and Superboy flees. In his place, Dr. Westfield refines Superboy's cloning formula and creates a new perfect clone of Superman that is obedient only to Lex Luthor. The clone is imprinted to Lex and behaves very much like a machine, remaining unresponsive unless given directions from its master. It's a cold, emotionless, and brutal killer. It's basically the Terminator, and this clone becomes known as the Eradicator, and he will serve as the villainous Superman within this ensemble of Supermen. The only two characters whom I could see having character arcs in this film would be Steel and Superboy. I have Superboy's arc figured out from where he starts off as a bratty, entitled celebrity who humbles himself and becomes a true hero. But I don't have Steel's arc quite figured out yet, and that inner journey will be the most critical out of all of the arcs in this story. As for what kind of movie this film will be, I'm not entirely sure yet either. Yes, obviously it will be a superhero movie, but the best superhero movies are not just superhero movies. They're usually melded in with other genres to help give each of their narratives a more unique identity. Joker was a supervillain origin story and a psychological thriller. Captain America the Winter Soldier was a superhero sequel and a spy movie. James Gunn's Suicide Squad was a supervillain ensemble and an action comedy. You get the idea. So. I could definitely see Reign of the Superman becoming a detective film and adopting the crime subgenre, but I could also see Reign of the Superman being a drama too, since there will be a lot of heavy emotions being thrown around concerning Superman's quote unquote death and who his successor should be. If you guys have any ideas on what subgenre the Reign of the Superman could fall under, go ahead and share them down below. I also don't have too many of the plot beats figured out yet. But some elements that I would like to include in this story would be the cult of Superman worshippers known as the Covenant of Krypton. While on the run, Superboy will take refuge with one of his fans that he went on a date with, a college freshman named Tana Moon. Superboy finds out that Tana is a member of the Covenant and they lure Superboy into their cult, at first appearing to be kind and warm, but the oblivious Superboy gets caught in their trap and the Covenant reveals their theory that when Superman died, his essence was split up into four avatars, and that in order to resurrect and restore the Man of Steel to his glorious former self, all four of the Superman need to be sacrificed on an altar in their temple. Luckily, Steel and Lois rescue Superboy just in time, and this experience contributes to Superboy's character development as he matures and sobers up. Another element that I would like to use is that despite the hero's efforts to find a cure for Bizarro's condition, they're ultimately unable to reverse Bizarro's cellular deterioration, and his death is a real punch to the gut for the rest of the heroes, since Bizarro was more or less a harmless child who wanted to be loved and accepted. But the world continued to reject him and judge him because of his appearance. Another story beat that I want to include in this movie is the eventual alliance between Lois, Jimmy, and the three Supermen 
as they team up to stop the Eradicator from carrying out Lex's plans. The final story beat on this list is that I would like for there to be a reveal that Lex is in fact behind the crime wave. He's secretly been arming Metropolis's criminals with his technology so that chaos can ensue in the city. He's doing this so that Lex can swoop in and paint himself as the savior by introducing the solution to the crime wave, his perfect LexCorp clone of Superman. Naturally, at the end of the day, Lex will still escape justice and remain innocent despite all of his illegal activities. One detail that I'd like to mention is that in order for this film to line up with the continuity of Zack Snyder's Justice League, none of the four Supermen can be available by the end of this film. By the time the credits roll, the Superman will either need to be dead, captured, or otherwise indisposed so that they don't interfere with the continuity of the Snyder Cut. On top of Bizarro dying, I'm imagining Eradicator will also perish and that Superboy can either finish off his arc by nobly sacrificing himself or he can go into hiding and move in with Martha in Smallville and change his name to Connor Kent in an effort to get a fresh start and begin a new life. But the only problem with that ending is that it begs the question as to why Superboy doesn't get involved with the Justice League in the Snyder Cut. So maybe it is just better off to kill Superboy in this movie. Anyways, by the end of this film, Steel's secret identity as John Henry Irons will be exposed. And despite his heroism, he is arrested for vigilanteism and all of his equipment and assets are seized. His time as a superhero is over. But Irons will soon after be released thanks to someone paying his bail. Dr. Irons will exit the prison and be prompted to enter a Wayne Enterprises limousine. Sitting inside is Bruce Wayne. Bruce will invite Irons inside the limo, explaining that he was the one who paid for his bail after Lois put in a good word for him. After Bruce found out about Iron's alter ego, he became impressed with the man's ingenuity and boldness. He knows that Steel can never again become a superhero out of fear of what will happen to his family, but that doesn't mean his life has to be over. Dr. Iron's career as a scientist can be reinstated, and he has a potential future at Wayne Tech. Bruce explains that the Wayne Tech department has been struggling without Lucius Fox, the department's original founder and manager. Bruce tells Irons that he would like for him to take on that position and become the new manager of Wayne Tech. Dr. Irons is overwhelmed with appreciation, thanking Bruce for the second chance. Bruce will tell Dr. Irons that the job does come with one catch. Bruce figures that Dr. Irons is too smart to fool, and he openly admits that Wayne Tech is a front. Bruce will say, here at Wayne Tech, we do more than manufacture tablets and security systems. We build hardware for people such as yourself, people who want to make the world a better place, but can't afford to do so under normal circumstances. Of course, complete discretion is mandatory. Otherwise, these individuals and their efforts will become compromised. Considering your background as the man of steel, we figured you'd be fairly open-minded about this discretion policy. You could be the perfect candidate for this job, John but we need to make sure that you're okay with keeping things off the books before we proceed any further. Dr. Irons confirms that he understands and he swears to abide by this rule, not wanting to ruin the second chance that he's been given. Bruce will then escort Dr. Irons to his penthouse, revealing the Batcave to him. Dr. Irons' jaw will drop in awe and then we cut to the end credits. As far as casting goes, I would want to hire John Boyega as Steel. Granted, any number of African American actors could play Steel. It's not a comic book role that requires a very specific skill set like the Joker. Actors like Arian Bakari and Daniel Kaluuya could easily kill it in this role. But the reason why I think Boyega would be a good fit for this role is because I think it would help show audiences just how much Boyega has to really offer as a performer by seeing him take on a role like John Henry Irons. Irons has always been a big believer in not just Superman, but for what Superman stands for. He truly believes in the ideals of justice, humility, honesty, and mercy. And since Boyega is known for being an advocate for justice in real life, it would be fitting to see him take on that same archetype on screen. If executed right, Boyega's portrayal of Steel could be empowering for Boyega as an actor because it would allow him the chance to redeem the lost opportunity that he experienced working on Star Wars. Fans were really expecting his character to become a beacon of hope and justice for the sequel trilogy. It was even implied that Finn could possibly be a source of inspiration for other stormtroopers who wished to defect from the First Order and stand up for what was right. Other rewrites here on YouTube, my channel included, have even gone as far as to write Finn as the inspiring paragon leader of a stormtrooper revolution. 
Boyega himself has gone on the record to say that he wished Finn had undergone such development in Star Wars, and was disappointed to never see it come to fruition. Here in the DCEU, Boyega could get that chance he never had in Star Wars, and fill in that role as a symbol of truth and freedom. Something that I think would be interesting would be to see Boyega use his natural Southeast London accent in his portrayal of Steel, because even though Steel has always been an American character, I think adding a little detail like that would be a cool way to make Steel that much more unique in the DCEU ensemble and help him stand out from other African American superheroes like Cyborg, Static Shock, Batwing, Black Lightning, Martian Manhunter, etc. For Superboy, I think it would be perfect if Dylan Sprayberry was cast for the role since he played the teenage version of Clark Kent in 2013's Man of Steel, and he still looks young enough to pass off as a teenager. Even though he would require a combination of makeup effects and CGI to bring him to life, I think Bizarro should still be played by Henry Cavill. It would be a great opportunity for Cavill to stretch his wings as an actor and play the big, dumb, and gentle giant archetypes. For the Eradicator, there's two ways that you could go about casting him. You could either have Henry Cavill pull double duty and play both Bizarro and the Eradicator, since the latter is supposed to be Lex's perfect clone, or if Henry Cavill is not up for that and wants to stick with just playing one character, then you could alternatively hire any of the runner-ups who auditioned to play Superman back in the original Man of Steel movie. Those runner-ups include actors like Matthew Good, Army Hammer, Matt Bomer, Zac Efron, and Colin O'Donoghue. Personally, I would go with Matt Bomer because out of all of those contenders, he physically looks the most like Henry Cavill. And even though he obviously has a different face than Cavill, they still resemble each other enough to pass as brothers, or in the case of this rewrite, clones. I also think that Dan Turpin could be a really fun character in this film, especially if you were to cast someone who brought some real Joe Pesci energy to the role. Obviously, Joe Pesci himself is in his late 70s and doesn't like doing large projects anymore, so the chances of casting him for the role would be slim to none. But Definitely somebody who brings that same kind of charisma would be perfect for the role of Dan Turpin. For the DCEU soundtrack, Superman is usually identified by Hans Zimmer's leitmotif, Flight. I think it would be really interesting if each of the four Supermen had their own leitmotifs that were remixes or incomplete versions of Flight, representing how neither are truly the Man of Steel despite their claims. and. As Steel and Superboy get closer to fulfilling their character arcs, their leitmotifs start to sound more and more like the pure original version of Flight. But it never quite sounds perfect because none of them could ever truly live up to Kal-El. Another idea could be to just give each of the four Supermen their own original leitmotifs and reserve Flight just for Superman. Either way, I think there's a really cool musical opportunity here for whoever would get brought on board as the composer for this hypothetical film. And that concludes my pitch for a live-action adaptation of The Reign of the Superman for my version of the DCEU. If you guys like this pitch and want to see more awesome videos from this channel, then go ahead and subscribe so that you can get notified when I drop a new video. Let me know what you all think of the pitch so far, and I will catch you guys next time.